So in the next um, 15 minutes or so, I, I, I kind of read down it to a couple goals here. One is why are AD handoffs, and particularly transitions of care, we'll just kind of broaden a little bit, especially important now in this time of history. And then, you know, kind of bottom line stuff. What are the practices for ED handoffs to other ER physicians, to hospitalists, to consultants, and then discharge back to primary care or their uh, provider in the community? So a little history. Um, so it was really only about seven years ago that it kind of started getting steam, this idea of handoffs, and we got to concentrate on handoffs. And that all kind of stemmed from National Patient Safety Goal 2E, which is essentially you need a standardized approach, which is kind of controversial, actually. You need a standardized approach to, to handoffs with an opportunity to ask and answer questions. So the Joint Commission picked this up, became a big, big emphasis 2006, 2007. The WHO starts making transitions a real high priority, you know, a top five of their patient safety priorities. Um, then the ACGME, which is the organization that um, kind of governs uh, residency programs, um, in 2010 said that we, it, it's going to be mandated that we're going to have to teach all our residents that. So last year we were over at CORD kind of teaching residents and residency directors how to hand off. Um, and this is a little bit in response to kind of a backlash of what happened in 2003 when they had all of a sudden the 80-hour work week, right? So all of a sudden they found, you know, not only do we need more workers and hence mid-levels and other sources of you know, less expensive workforce, but they also found out there's more handoffs, you know, because if your surg surgical residents were on Q2, you know, and they were only, you know, Q4 or Q5, there were just more patients, more handoffs, and they need to get better at doing it. And f probably most um, relevant to us is that the ACA healthcare reform makes a very high priority on care coordination and transition of care. Um, and so we'll talk a little about that. So um, Dr. Seberg was actually in the back room said, hey, I saw your slides and you're quoting me. Um, and <laughs> I said, that's a, that's a compliment, right? Um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't there at the 2011 address, but read it later. And this is kind of an overarching kind of theme that I kind of want to use for this little talk here, is that emergency physicians must consider stepping out of our perceived comfort zone and perception only of providing acute care. So we're kind of used to viewing emergency medicine as an island. We're a silo. It's us versus them. We chose emergency medicine because we like it this way. You know, we, we show up for our shift and then we leave and, you know, leave all the worries behind. And that's certainly true. But I think if we're going to prove our value in emergency medicine in the future, we got to learn how to be better teammates. You know, we have to think, okay, we are a bridge. We're kind of a hub to other services. So we're a hub to... Uh, uh, the PCP, you know, because we receive patients from them. We're a hub to the inpatient service because the vast majority of uh, admissions come through the emergency department. And if you look at, you know, if you take OB out of there, we're a vast majority of admissions to the uh, hospital. And then back to the primary care world. So that's how kind of I organize my talk. The emergency physician sort of at the hub, and then the PCP, the emergency physician, consulting physician, and admitting physician kind of uh, on the outside. So first, focusing on the emergency physician to emergency physician handoff. And this is kind of where I got my start. Um, like Sherry mentioned about, I don't know, I started getting handoffs about four years ago. And it was kind of serendipitous, you know. It's kind of one of these things where, you know, one thing leads to another, and all of a sudden you find yourself in some, you know, in, in, in some managerial position. You don't know how you got there. But then you're there. And then all of a sudden, you know, tasks coming down the line, and they said, you know, we have the section grant, can you minister it, blah, blah, blah. And I said, sure, what's it about? And he goes, it's about handoffs. Because I know nothing about handoffs. You know, and I'm not actually that interested in handoffs. But if you need a project manager, I'm happy to be your project manager. You know, I run these things, that's fine. And the kind of funny thing is that I became actually very, very interested in handoffs and very, very interested in transitions. And that's sort of kind of taken over my life. But this, um, this paper, um, which Sheer mentioned, I'm not sure if it's a definitive paper, but it's, it's, it's a well-known one out there. And a lot of the credit, I mean, really, it, it was a group effort. It was, it was from the section of quality improvement, patient safety. Um, you know, 25% of the offers here were in this room at some point um, during this conference. Um, and it, we really kind of shaped a, a lot of the thinking about handoffs in ED. So part of that grant was we did an ASEP Council survey back in 2008, and we got tremendous turnout, mainly because, you know, we had all our members spread out and handing people and getting them back. So we had like a 75% um, return rate, 
And the, the couple surprising findings. One is that the vast, or the median, at least 50% of the people, at least at council in their hospitals, had less than five handoffs per shift, which was kind of interesting because, you know, then there was the opposite extreme where about 5% of the um, hospitals had greater than 30 per shift on average. You know, and I've kind of worked in both shops. Like right now I get maybe two, two to five, but I've worked in those big high volume shops where you know, you're signing out everybody and it, it's huge. The other thing that was really kind of surprising was that there's widely varying pr practices. I guess it's not so surprising. We did a similar a survey at CORD, which is Council of Residency Directors. Um, back in 2011, we got 147 responses, which is about half of the GME um, programs. And the real surprising finding here was that only 3% or so said that their handoff system was effective. So I'll just kind of get to the bottom line here. So we came out with a bunch of recommendations at the end of our paper, of that white paper. And um, th this is what kind of came, came down to. Best practices, try to reduce the number of unnecessary handoffs if possible, if possible. Okay, you don't want to, you know, um, not hand off a patient or truncate a workup or speed them along, just avoid a handoff. But if you can, systematically try to avoid unnecessary handoffs. So a couple, couple suggestions for that. Overlapping shifts, you know, so that, you know, when you end at seven, it's not like the person's coming in at seven, they're coming in at six or five. Um, or at a certain point at the end of your shift, you start, you know, picking up the fast track patients. You know, you don't pick up the 86-year-old ultra mental status. You know, you don't pick up the septic patient. You try to be very selective on who you pick up. Second, it's kind of a no-brainer, but limit in interruptions and distractions. Easier said than done, um, especially in a busy emergency department. I mean, I know the nurses on the floor get a lot of flack for saying, you know, we can't take um, report or whatever because we're in sign out and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, and I can't justify everything they do, but we do have to adopt, you know, for 10 minutes, we're going to talk because this is really important and this is a very kind of dangerous procedure that we do, probably perhaps the most dangerous procedure we do um, during the course of our shift. Third, structure the order of the handoff. So there's many ways to do this, but it's essentially structure the order because it's much easier to catch a pass when you can anticipate where it's coming from, right? So if the person's signing out to you, you don't want to go, okay, this person and this person, this person's sick, this person's not sick, this person's room three, room 12. I mean, it's all over the place. It's really hard to kind of keep track, right? So the ways you can structure the handoff are start with the sickest and go down to the least sick. You could do geographic. So if you have a large ER, start from one end of the room, go to the other. For e people on EHRs, you just kind of click and, you know, you go to all your providers and go from top of the screen to the bottom screen, but you've got to find some way to structure the handoff. And the idea behind this is you don't want to forget anybody, too, okay? So, and I'll talk about later about who, who are the ones that we typically forget. Fourth, provide a succinct overview. Um, so you want a blanket statement, you know, 41-year-old, atypical chest pain, no cardiac risk factors, going off stress test, if it's negative, you can discharge them, okay? You don't want a bunch of details. You know, I, re I remember when I was uh, a, a resident or even a junior attending, it was kind of a badge of honor, a badge of pride to see how much detail I could give about every patient because it showed how well I knew them. On the receiving end, you don't want to hear that. You know, you're not going to remember that. You want some, you know, you want a nugget. You want something to pin, pin that patient in your memory for the future. Fifth, communicating outstanding tasks. Um, and and, and that's, that's real important because part of a handoff is transferring responsibility, authority, and responsibility. I mean, well, you know, it, it's yours. So what are you going to be responsible? What am I going to be responsible for? The last one, on, on this slide at least, is um, best practice. Make information available for direct review. So it's really easy now with electronic medical records, um, with PAC systems. The more that the person who's receiving it can kind of make sense of the objective data themselves, the better the handoff goes. So it's kind of nice if somebody's kind of speaking in your ear, you know, whispering the narrative of the patient, and you're sitting there kind of looking at the EKG, looking at the labs, looking at the radiology uh, exams yourself. And then finally, encourage questioning and discussion of assessments. And this we just don't do well. I mean, as, as many times as you tell people, you know, make a period for, you know, questions and answers, people just don't do it. 
you know, because you're usually kind of overwhelmed a little bit when you're hearing it, right? And you've got one ear listening for the patients who are coming through the door and then the other ear for the patients that you're responsible for. Um, one best practice that, that, that we kind of talked about and which I highly encourage is make yourself available later on for questions and, and, and assessment. So kind of ear culture is, you know, once I leave, when I leave the door, you can't reach me. You know, I'm gone. You know, so because a lot of times the questions come up later, you know, five minutes, ten minutes later. So leave a phone number, some way that you can get, get, get in contact. Second, account for all patients. I alluded to this earlier. So the high-risk patients, I mean, it, it's, it, it was kind of funny on this call with 20, 25 people, and we, we did this for over the course of like six months. One of the recurring themes was, and, and people first were embarrassed to admit it, but was like, I forgot about the patient. You know, it's like halfway to my shift, who is this coming back from somewhere, you know? Or, or, you know, somebody, you know, when the people are lined in halls and stuff like that, you find out, you know, at 4 o'clock in the morning, who, okay, who's left, you know? And then you're finding, does anybody know this guy? You know, he's been sleeping for the past eight hours, right? Um, so one of the most basic things is account for all patients. Now, high-risk patients that we will tend to forget about are the people that leave the emergency department, so they're off on dialysis or radiology study or something, and they're out for hours, and then it's like they come back, and you forgot them because out of, out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, other people that are high, uh, high risk are um, patients who are admitted, so, you know, we're, we easy to go, oh, oh, this one's easy, they're admitted, you know. But with boarding now, they could be there for hours, if not days, right? And so we know nothing about that patient that is admitted and boarded. Discharged patients as well. So we like to, you know, try to make it really neat, you know, that the patient's kind of like all wrapped up and ready to go. They're appropriately uh, dispositioned. But then, you know, something happens, right? And so those are the patients that biggest headache because it's like, I thought they were gone. I know nothing about them, right? And the nurse says, well, you know, they're vomiting now. What do I do? And he goes, who are they? You know? So the, another pr uh, set of patients. Another one that has kind of come up recently with the advent of mid-levels is the mid-level patients. Um, so it's, you know, sometimes the mid-levels see their own patients, they seem in concordance with us, and then when you sign out, it's like the mid-level leaves or the mid-level gets problems with the patient and you're like, who are they, you know? And so one of par partners always tries to sign out, oh, you don't have to worry about them, it's a mid-level patient. Well, now it's my patient, you know? It, it, it's change of shift and I need to know everybody. Last thing is, you know, give up the reluctance to take ownership of the patient. So. Um, you know, again, I think it's natural habit when you come on to shift. You, you want the patient's disposition to be clear. You know, I don't care what the disposition is, but it's got to be clear. They got to be dead. They got to be, you know, going to the ICU. They're going home. I don't care, but the disposition's got to be clear, right? So um, sometimes they're just not clear or something comes up. They were discharged. The instructions were set, but they're not going, right? So we really resist the... Uh, the, the, the uh, temptation to avoid taking ownership of the patient after they leave. So some controversial stuff, standardization, how much do you do standardization? It's kind of funny because at the ASAP Council, when we asked them, how would you fix handoffs? Two thirds of them said, oh, just standardize it. You know, it's, it's like that, that's easy. Um, and it's kind of interesting because on our panel of experts, it was like, you can't standardize this, you know? And also, you don't want to standardize it for everybody, so you're going through this litany of stuff that you don't want to know um, for every patient. It's like always the creatin, you know, always give me this, always give me that, you know? It, so you want patients that are tucked away, that are not acute, you know, short, and then other people you need to talk about it longer. We won't go through any other controversies for now, just for sake of time. So, you know, one thing leads to another. And um, a couple years later, it said, you know, e you know the EPEP -EP handoffs, that, that was all great. But, you know, we also hand off a lot to admitting patients. I mean, that, that's, that, that's where kind of a little comes dicey because, you know, they're not always on our team. We get into conflicts. And so a group of us said, okay, we really got to focus on handoffs to hospitalists. Um, so this was kind of a very interesting group. We just published this about six months ago. And um, it was a group of emergency physicians and a group of hospitalists. And then we had two communication experts on our team as well. 
who were um, Emily Patterson and Julie Apker, who are just phenomenal and have published a lot, especially not only in healthcare, but especially this transition between emergency physicians and hospice or between emergency physicians. Then we kind of had an interesting grouping. Um, so the emergency physicians are in blue, the hospice are in red, and we specifically picked these teams because all of us were very interested in handoffs. All of us had published in the handoff literature. Um, but Chris was, you know, at Northwestern, and he was the lead author and lead of this project. And Chris worked with Mark Williams and Kevin O'Leary. So if you don't know Mark Williams, Mark Williams is the editor-in-chief of their hospital medicine. He was the previous president of SHM, Society for Hospital Medicine, similar to our, our ASAP. And I, um, my counterpart was Eric Howell over at Hopkins. Um, and he kind of started up the hospice medicine program over at Hopkins. He's done a lot of stuff, really good stuff with active bed management, which, I, which I'm not sure if you read about. Um, but great, great uh, pr proponent of the emergency department. And then Jay Shore uh, was matched up with Le Leora Horowitz because he had his time at Yale when he was doing his RWJ fellowship there. Leora was also there doing her RWJ fellowship, and she pu has published quite a bit, actually, in emergency to primary care and emergency to um, hospitalist uh, transitions. So it's kind of interesting. And then, and then Bob, well, it's just Bob, Bob just knows everybody. But anyway, so, and th that's Bob Wears. Um, so it was kind of very interesting because over the course of nine months, we would have these bi-weekly meetings, and it was, it was a friendly crowd. I mean, we, we handpicked these people, you know, we're generally very hospitalist friendly, they were generally very ER friendly, and we just kind of sat at the table for a couple hours, every couple of weeks, and hashed over certain things. You know, it's like, okay, we got to get our people together because, you know, our relationship isn't always the most friendly with the hospitalists, and so we, we got to sit down and figure some stuff out. So the first thing we did was we tried to have each other's side explain what was it like to be an emergency physician, okay? So let us tell our side, and then let's hear your side and see you know, where we can find common ground and why, why there is conflict. So a whole list of things, but I'll just focus on three here. Um, so the emergency physician, by training, we focus on the immediate next step. We don't know the general, we don't know their diagnosis all the time, we don't know their eventual disposition, but we, we know what to do in the next hour, you know? So, um, and, and that's our focus. You know, for example, pneumonia, right? We don't care about blood cultures because, I mean, if you bring up blood cultures or the blood culture core measures to an emergency uh, medicine group, it's kind of a non-starter, you know? It's kind of like, it really kind of sours the conversation, right? Um, <laughs> because we don't care about blood cultures. We don't see them, we don't react to them, and for us, they're kind of useless. They rarely come back, come back positive, right? But for the hospitalist, they, they also realize, yeah, it, it doesn't come back positive that often, but you know, when it does, it's really helpful. Because you know the triple antibiotics you started them on? I can narrow it down to one, you know? Or the influenza that came back positive, I can stop the antibiotics. You know, so it's a kind of real big deal for them. For us, by training, again, we're, we're comfortable with limited data in an evolving clinical course, you know? So we're just used to it, it's part of our nature. Uh, ambulance comes through the door, they're altered, you know, we have no history, you know? And we're good with that, you know? We're kind of used to it, right? You can't, get water, you can't get water out of a rock, right? So we don't worry about it, you know? We can't get old records, you know, on most of our patients. Even if they have old records, we can't access them, right? So we're kind of comfortable with that. The hospitalist really, really values data, concrete data, verification of that data, um, and that's just the way they're, 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 they're set. I mean, that, that, I think that's why certain people go into emergency medicine, some people go into internal medicine, because we're just kind of different mindsets. But, you know, it's important to, to hear that because, you know, if I have a person with chest pain coming to the emergency department, they had a stress test six months ago, but it's over at the county hospital and it's three o'clock in the morning, it's very unlikely I'm gonna get those records, right? And it's kind of a scary story, so I'm gonna admit that person. The hospitalist, on the other hand, says, you know, it's worth going after that information because if we get that information, it's gonna save a lot of hard work, unnecessary testing down the line and cost. And so, we, you know, both of us, I think, value efficiency. We both want to be efficient, right? Um, I think our efficiency is kind of more in the short term. It's kind of like, 
I, I need to get this person out because I don't know who's coming through the door next, you know, and, that, and there's that kind of anxiety, right, because I got to prepare, I got to have some capacity or buffer to handle the next hit, right, and the, and, and the hospitalists are, they also value efficiency, but they're all kind of a little more longer term, kind of thinking, okay, well, if I do this now, it may save me two, three days down the line, or it might save the PCP, you know, or they might need not need a pick line for a month, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they, they value efficiency too, and I think we need to respect that. And I think, again, kind of my, my themes that I started early in, in, in my talk was, we gotta get ourselves out of the silo of thinking, okay, you know, they're in my ear for two hours, four hours, you know, what's the best thing for them? And kind of expanding that buffer a little bit to thinking, okay, well, I got to think a little more long term about my colleagues and about the patient because, you know, it's, it's everybody's resources, right? It's not just, it's off my plate, it's onto somebody else's plate. Okay, so best practices that we came up. So this came through hours and hours of listening to the hospitalist. Okay, well, in a handoff, what do you want? Really, what do you want? Um, because sometimes we get the feeling we're giving it to you, other times we're not giving it to you. Um, so they said at the outstart, severity and stability. You gotta tell me if I gotta see this person now or I can wait a few hours. Because unbeknownst to me, especially in the large centers, the hospitalist you call is not the hospitalist who takes care of them, okay? So they're like the triage hospitalist. You know, they take the phone calls and they might hand it off to a resident, they might hand it off to another hospitalist, they might wait for a change of shift, and so they gotta know, do I need to see them now? Not only clinically, but you know, are they gonna be mad? You know? So don't, don't set them up for failure saying that, oh, the hospitalist is gonna see you up right, right away, because it ain't gonna happen, right, most, most of the time. So, so the thing was, please don't set us up for failure, because it's hard to recover from. Don't overstate the working diagnosis. So, on the hospital side, you know, they were saying, we know, we know some of our colleagues, t you know, just ask you, so what do they got? What do they got? Just tell me what they got, right? And so we say, they got pneumonia, you know, or they got this, they got that. We don't really know, you know, because they might be a little hypoxic, maybe a little of fever, equivocal chest x-ray. We're not really sure they have pneumonia. They might have a PE or they might be in failure or something like that. And so don't overstate the working diagnosis. Now, if, if you got the diagnosis, you know, right on the spot, sure, let them know, give them your reasoning. But if you don't, don't lead them to think that you're more certain than you are. And that, and that was a really, really big take-home point. Another big home take home point was summarize everything, okay? I don't wanna know the details. And this is kind of different because, you know, a lot of times we were, we trained in academic centers and we were talking to interns or residents who wanted to know everything, right? They wanted to know the entire physical exam. But now we're talking to like career hospitalists, right? So they don't wanna know every detail. They kinda gotta figure it out. They wanna know what the summary is. In particular, what they said, they cannot get out of the ED record is response to treatments. So they can tell when, you know, what they were given, when they were given it, but they, they had a really hard time figuring out what happened when you gave it. When you gave that NEB, what happened, right? Did they get worse? Did they get better? So that was a really, really big request. And then assignment for pending uh, data and tasks, similar to emergency physicians, you got to split it up. You know, it's like, I'm okay sending them to the CT scanner on the way up to the floor, but I'm signing out. And so you got to pick it up, you know, so they're, they're really explicit, you know, what tasks do you have? And then state unusual circumstances, DNR, isolation, uh, you know, they're, they're demented and, and it's three o'clock in the morning and their family's going home, who knows the history, right? So passing on phone numbers, things like that, that's really important to them. So handoffs to consultants, making our th th third uh, spoke of the wheel here. So. A lot of this uh, credit goes to Chad Kessler, who's done a lot of work in this area, and we just put out a paper in annals this month. So if you get your um, annals, um, we, come up, we came up with a taxonomy of emergency department consultations um, and how do you do it, you know? And he talks specifically about the five C's model. We won't talk about what exactly is a consult. It's, it's a long discussion. So consultation, the five C's. So contact, communicate, core question, collaborate and closing the loop. So contact, really important, because a lot of times the consultants, you don't know, they don't know you. And I used to be very casual about who I was, you know, friendly, hi, this is Dixon, I'm at Sky Ridge. Um, 
you know, I'm requesting this, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't know who Dixon is, right? Are you the nurse? Are you the mid-level? Are you the attending physician? So now I go, you know, uh, uh, I'm Dr. Chung, you know? So not less, I mean, more formal, but they know who you are, right? And similar, when you're, when you're talking to somebody, you really want to find out who they are because it kind of, it, it kind of frames the conversation. And communicate. Again, the main thing there being summarized. They don't want a litany of facts. Um, and then this is the big thing. This is the really big thing, is that when, you, when we started talking around to the consultants, what they really, really wanted and what really kind of annoyed them from the conversation with the emergency physicians is, what do you want from them, right? So you, you, you give them a long story, you give them a bunch of labs, x-rays, and it's like, okay, you gotta tell me, do you want me to come in? Do you need me to do a procedure? Do you just want me to follow up with them? What would you like from me? And, and that was really important. And then collaborate. So you, you, you kind of decide together, how are we going to handle this clinical set situation? How are we going to manage uh, this patient? So you have an open fracture at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, we don't admit all open fractures. They don't all go to the OR. So it's like, okay, if it's a grade one open fracture, it's okay, I'll put them in antibiotics and you're going to see them in the office tomorrow. You know, that's fine if it's Wednesday and they're going to see in the office Thursday, but if it's Friday and they're not going to see them until Monday, that's not such a great plan, right? So you kind of kind of collaborate, how are we going to solve this together? And finally, in closing the loop again, say, you know, so I understand I'm going to put them on antibiotics here, right? And you're going to see them tomorrow, right? At 9 a.m., right? Okay. <laughs> Just so that we're all clear here, okay? That's real important. So we kind of talked about this, best practices, um, speak their language. So if you're, you're, if you're calling a hand surgeon, you want to go, you know, they're uh, a right hand, they, they injured their dominant right hand, they're a musician, um, because it kind of speaks their language. You know, they want to know what their occupation is. They want to know, are they right-handed or left-handed? Um, and build relationships. And this is the thing we got out with the hospitalists, too. Um, I think we really kind of underestimate the value of social relationships. You know, I think I, I kind of really really kind of um, me and Eric Ahal, the hospitals that we worked with on the pile, kind of, kind of really developed a, a relationship of trust after a while because, you know, I go to the hospitalist bowling parties. You know, they invite me and I go. You know, so it's, you know, when you're sharing, you know, a drink with somebody, playing bowling, I mean, you kind of get that bond. You know, we used to break crabs, you know, with each other in Maryland, you know, in Annapolis. And it's a real bonding experience, you know, so you kind of really learn who they are, they trust them, okay, you know, we might have arguments and stuff like that, but it's just kind of a different in perspectives, and, and let's come to a common ground here. Okay, so last, um, quote from Sue Nesda, who's the VP for patient safety at the AMA, and, in, and an emergency physician, says, right now it's hard to go home feeling good at the end of the day when you're worried about patients whom you discharge, because they go off to who knows where and what happens to them, right? And so, this is kind of what I'm working on now. And a lot of this, well, I can't say I'm working on it. It's actually Julius Pham, who's at Hopkins, is working on it. Um, he just received a, a, you know, close to a seven-figure grant from HRQ to work on ED discharges um, that he started a couple months ago. And so there's three main areas that he's looking at. He says, really, for discharging ER uh, patients, there's really three barriers. One happens at discharge, kind of communicating to patients and educating them about their condition, about what to do about them. Coordinating care with other providers and, and services when they land. And then supporting post-ED discharge care. Kind of that no man's land between you leaving the ER to your landing somewhere else. And, you know, we really, I think emergency medicine, need to take more ownership after they get discharged. You know, we tend to go, okay, you get discharged, you're off, you know, you're not our responsibility, you're in the court of the PCP or the specialist. But we really need to start thinking, how do we bridge that gap? You know, is it community paramedics? You know, do we send them out to the home? Is it for a phone call after, they, after their discharge? Do we have a follow-up clinic in the emergency department? Um, you know, that we schedule, and you can merit with handoffs, so it's maybe the last two hours of your shift or something. So as you're cleaning things up, you're kind of seeing these follow-up uh, wound checks and things like that. So this is just a graph of how he organizes it in, in some examples. And so, you know, he asks for um, suggestions. So we've polled and we've solicited many groups that are interested in ED discharge. And if you have any suggestions, anything that works at your shop, especially that's not published, because we kind of got the published literature um, under our belt, 
But if you guys are doing something really innovative um, and it works, please, please let me know because over the next three, four months, we're going to kind of come up with a plan to figure out what can we test. And we, and we have a good budget to do this. He's got a lot of experts. He's got a lot of support to do this. And it's just one really great opportunity to figure out what works, what doesn't work. So my time's up. So um, and the day's over. I really thank you for staying. Um, I know it's been a really long day. Your folks are probably the same people that sit in the front row in school. Um, but appreciate your time. And if you have questions, please email me. Uh, and it's at the end. Thank you.